Welcome to the ACS Technical Advisory Board podcast series, where we talk all things tech including data, cyber, AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things. Meet your host, Dr. David Cook, Vice President of the Australian Computer Society's Technical Boards. David is a technology advocate dedicated to advances and progression of computing and human-computer interaction. In today's episode, David will be talking with Matthias Gartner. Matthias is the current director of the Technical Advisory Boards at the Australian Computer Society. Join us as we discuss supply chain attacks, generative AI, and the differences between privacy standards in Australia compared to Europe. Today, we're talking with Matthias Gartner. Matthias is a publicly accredited and sworn in expert witness for IT. He's a data privacy officer for over 40 companies. He was the vice president at NIFIS, which is the National Initiative for Information Security. Um, He's been a lecturer in Germany at the University of Applied Science in Darmstadt. And currently, he's also lecturing uh, in two universities in Australia, at Torrens University and Lincoln Institute. He's best known for data privacy, for data security, cyber security, and he's the technical director for the ACS for the TAB. Welcome to the podcast, Matthias. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I want to start by asking you a little bit about something that I know is passionate to you, and that is this increasing focus on supply chain attacks and what that means. Just how dangerous are they and what does it look like? Well, supply chain attacks are nothing new, actually, but um, the increased frequency of breaches there um, is a big concern because the underlying principle that we have in our business is that we trust our supply chain in a way. And this has been shattered right now. Uh, various reasons. Um, one is just the supply chain um, has some faults like the CrowdStack system or even really infiltration like the exec library we had in the early of the year. And, and, and this really rattles on our belief that whatever we buy from someone is sound and safe. We can no longer afford to do that. But on the other hand, how should we mitigate it? There's no way of asking Microsoft, can I, source, uh, can I have your source code and see if it's working right? Uh, even if we have the source code in Linux, for example, we can't do it really because it's too complicated. And, and that really concerns me quite a lot because I have no idea how that will turn out in the future. That, it's a problem of, of about trust really, isn't it? Yes. We're, asked, we're yep. being asked repeatedly, even though we might be experts, we're being asked to trust something instead yep. of actually being able to verify something. And it's an, an unsettling thing. When you see it manifest at scale in big companies, yeah. this this idea that you know thousands and thousands of large companies put their trust in CrowdStrike, it, it's one of those issues where it's not that CrowdStrike were deliberately doing something no. wrong, but that you're just unable to have control over the various variabilities. And, and, and this is really the thing. Previously, we could trust, or at least it was quite okay, but now it's being a problem, or it's becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, developers rely on public libraries the function of it, we don't know. They don't know. They just use it. Is it good? Is it bad? Does it have malware in it? They don't know. They just use it and introduce a probably backdoor or probably a big problem into the company. Let's uh, jump over to one of the emerging um, challenges to this area, and that's generative mm-hmm. AI, because with generative AI, obviously, yeah. we can we can interrogate anybody can interrogate at a different level. And I wonder also, it means you can also infiltrate at a different level. What do you think are the big challenges and, and you know, what are the things that keep you up late at night about generative AI? It, it basically boils down to the same thing. If my boss calls me on the phone and tells me to do this or that, can I trust this person? Is it really my boss? Um, previously, it, was, it, it required quite a lot of effort to really try to impersonate someone. Now it's just computer generated with ease, even with video, which makes it more believable in, in, in our social environment. And, and that is really a big thing because we now have to start thinking of how can we verify those requests, verify those issues that, that someone gives me. Do I really have to call that person back, which takes ages? Probably I can't even reach that person, so it delays business. Or do we have to do some technical measures which are likely not very good because that would require, for example, certificates. But that would mean somebody has to check them, somebody has to introduce them, and, 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 and. And this is something, again, an an issue where I don't have any really good idea on how to solve the problem except for telling people, be careful. Hmm. And I I guess along with that is, as you pointed out, the development of large language models has now really started to 
dig in with the visual side of that, the, yep. the VLMs as opposed to the LMs, the visual language models. They don't just allow for deep fakes, but they also allow for um, the ability to, um, you know, to, to just strip away all of the trust systems yep. we have. Because on the one hand, we're trying to use something which is based on an IT program, and at the same time, we can't divorce ourselves from the, the from yep. the concept that we want to know if you and I are real and if we're actually talking to a real person or watching a real person's video or whatever. So yep. it's going to be tricky for a while. And I, I wonder mm -hmm. whether that means that we need to find different ways in which we can guarantee the security. As you, you mm -hmm. said about the, the difficulty of calling someone back, yep. that, that for the most part, that's my go-to place. If I'm unsure about something, I'll say, I'll just ring them back and say, was that you? Did you really yep. say that? Or is, that, is, this, you know, is this text message from you and so on? Yeah. But it's cumbersome. It's cumbersome and, and so it, it disrupts has, the process. Yep. So industry mm -hmm. has to find something else. Yep. And yep. I wonder what that is. Yeah, exactly. There's nothing on the horizon as far as I know. Mm. That's the problem. Obviously, you've got a European background. Yep. You're from Germany, and I, I guess you would have a unique understanding of the, the the privacy and the way in which it's working out in Australia. We kind of we watch eagerly about GDPR. We're kind of on board with many of the concepts, but we're not we're not signed up to it. You've had that experience from GDPR mm -hmm. in Europe. Can you tell us, you know, where are we at, and and, and what are the key differences, and how, where do we have what's that middle ground that we have to find? At the moment, Australia is still a long way away. There, there is some legislation coming, so it, it probably that will mitigate that thing a bit. But basically, the, the first fundamental concept is who owns the data. That's a conceptual difference. In Europe, the data is always owned by the person that describes is described by the data, whereas in Australia, that's not so. If Google generates some data about me, it's their data, not mine. This is one of the fundamental problems or differences. Uh, the second one is, um, I see that in, in, in a lot of jurisdictions, is that politicians are very hesitant to, to create fines or to introduce fines. And this is one of the things that needs to be done. And I see that it works quite well in Europe, even though we can argue about a lot of things about GDPR, of course. Mm. But at least the fine system does take hold at the moment, and it really gives them a slap on the wrist. And so they change. And or some companies even do a lot of things to avoid getting fined. And that is something that probably Australia has to introduce as well. Some of the crazy ideas Australia has, like putting CEOs in jail or something, that would be too far-fetched in my opinion. But as it is at the moment, we can do everything and nothing happens. Hmm. That can't work. It's interesting, hmm. isn't it, that that um, we're measuring hmm. trust in terms of how much money it will cost to be seen to be trustworthy <laughs> or <laughs> how much how much I'm prepared to yeah. risk in terms of a potential fine. So, yeah. And it sounds like in Australia you can afford to be a little bit riskier because... Yep. Because there's no really, you know, there's no teeth into any of these this, this legislation. At least at the moment, yeah. Um, one of the things with GDPR is I probably will have to mention that is what well, first of all, of course, it's data privacy. I mean, that's the, the, the legislation's name itself. But the secondary reason for the introduction of the GDPR is cybersecurity, because by forcing companies to secure their the, the private data, they also secure the other data as well. And in, in our societies, all of Western societies, we can't force organizations to do that, except if they are critical infrastructure. But for a, any small, medium or larger enterprise, they can do whatever they want with their intellectual property. But that opens up a lot of can of worms. We all know state-based actors trying to steal IP and stuff. But with the introduction of the GDPR, they have to do something. Not for their IP, but they would be stupid of not doing it. So that's the secondary reason why this law is in effect as it is. Matthias Gartner, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. To find out more about how the ACS is powering Australia's technology brilliance, visit us at our website, Facebook or LinkedIn. Want to get involved with the ACS technical boards? Email us at tab at acs.org.au and tell us a bit about yourself. Join us for more thought leadership, ideas and information through our other podcasts on the ACS YouTube, Facebook or on LinkedIn.